Great. And um, let me get the ball rolling here. I am okay. going to uh, move it over to my desktop. Let me introduce myself again. Let me say I'm Harold Davis. And uh, this is about the secrets of night photography. I'm The first uh, slide I have here has contact information for me. I'm going to show this uh, slide at the end of the presentation as well. And let me mention a couple of things about it. But before I do that, let me also note I've seen a couple of private chat questions come across to me before we get started. And I, I just can't physically answer them right now. But I will try to get to them as I go through the presentation. And let me encourage you to either make those questions public or to send them into Catherine so that she can cue them and remember to ask me about them as it seems appropriate or as they come up so that everyone can uh, share in the answers. Uh, this slide has my websites, Digital Field Guide, photoblog2.com, and digitalnight.us. Perhaps more importantly, it has my email address, info at photoblog2.com. I answer all my email. I love to talk about photography. So if after this uh, presentation you do, in fact, have any specific questions related to anything uh, about photography, don't hesitate to email me, and I'll email you back. There are no stupid questions. I firmly believe that. I get a huge range of questions in my workshops and presentations from them very most basic things to things that are way too complicated for me to really know the answer to. So I, I do my best to, uh, to help with everything. And with that, let's get started with the presentation. In, in this presentation, before I get to the night, which has become one of my true passions in photography, I like to start out with a bit of my other photography because Night photography has been important to um, help inform the other kinds of work that I do. If you can photograph in pitch black, uh, standing at the edge of a 3,000 foot cliff and actually get results out of it, then it's likely that you're going to be able to photograph anything, for starters. For second, second of all, the exposure problems that you find in night photography help inform proper exposures for all kinds of uh, work. So most of my uh, photography books tend to have some night photography in it. It's not all the photography. And one of my good uh, photography friends said to me, Harold, remember, there are other things to photograph besides darkness. And of course, that's true. Uh, the, the to photograph, as people know, means to write with light. And, when, and so you write in light both in daytime and in relative darkness. This is a cover of a book of mine called Light and Exposure that's published by O'Reilly Media. And, it's, and a fair amount of it is about issues that happen in difficult exposure situations. So it's relevant to night photography. And there are some case studies about how to properly expose in dark and night conditions in the book. This is a book I did last year, uh, or really over the course of about five years, of uh, photography in the Sierras, which is one of the places that I really like to photograph at night best in all the world. And one of the things we're going to talk about as we go on in this presentation is what does it take? What equipment do you have? What safety precautions should you have if you set off on a place that is a trail going into darkness in the night in the wilderness? And that, that, leads up, that leads me back to the question of what is night photography? Because it's different things to different people. There are many schools of night photography. To start with, you can photograph a city at night. Very different kettle of fish from photographing in the deep landscape in, at night. A city tends to have an exposure time somewhere between, say, 30 seconds and two minutes sometimes less than that. And, and at night, in the star sky and darkness, you can be up to uh, 30, 40 minutes or even more if you're doing aggregate exposures. Um, another thing that people like to do with night photography is they like to use artificial light. 
of some kind to either paint a kind of light graffiti, which is an interesting thing to do, or a light kanji, a character painted with light, or to selectively light paint certain areas of subject matter. And as, as we go along, I will show you some examples of those kinds of photos as well. This, uh, the 100 Views of the Golden Gate is a book I did also over a series of many years, which is the views of the Golden Gate, some of them at night, some of them in the day, some of them at sunset. And partly the idea here was to follow uh, the great Japanese artist Hokusai, who did a similar kind of work of Mount Fuji and to portray the Golden Gate Bridge in many of its different guises. Though I find the late sunset, early sunrise, night views perhaps the most spectacular. I'm including, as I said, a couple of my non-night images as I start this show because they show what I'm interested in and most in photography. And the, the views that make me fascinated are things that are paradoxes or things that make you do double takes, that make you look at them and say, what is that? So this is a series of endless doors. This is another of the subjects that move me most in my photography, namely my new daughter, Katie Rose. So this was effectively an extremely low light photo. Um, the exposure here was done with one uh, 15 watt bulb and I used an ISO of about of 1500 on the photo. Uh, one approach to extreme low light conditions is to, is to shoot with a really high S ISO. And sometimes that can lead to interesting results. When I post-processed this photo, I converted the noise that was there using uh, the Photoshop filter to, uh, to be film grain. And I, I like the way this came out. It's, it's um, a tricky subject matter and a kind of nighttime solution. Here's one of my daytime photos of Yosemite. This is a multiple prize winning photo that, uh, that I, I'm pleased with the way it came out and a near early dawn photograph of a dandelion covered with early morning dew just as the sun was rising. Again, a kind of night photo, but not what you typically think of as a, as, as a photograph of the night. And this is a, uh, this dragonfly shows some of my work that is a cross or composite between the Photoshop painting and photography, which I did as part of a, uh, of an assignment for a series of book covers for a series called The uh, Ringing Cedars of Russia here. This is the book cover that it ended up on, number two in the series. And this was very much the kind of thing where I, I did an original picture of the dragonfly on a light box, and then everything after that was painting in Photoshop. Um, the client would come back and say, hey, that's too green, that's too red, change that a little. The, the photograph itself took me about an hour. The Photoshop work took me a week. So that, that gives you some idea of what the, um, what the relative time of a lot of what I do tends, tends to be. This, this is included here because this is a uh, photograph using a light box as the light source for transparency. And when I photograph for transparency, I try to bang the histogram on the right side of the, uh, of the histogram scale. A histogram is a graph that shows a distribution of values. The exposure histogram shows the distribution of values from light to dark. Theoretically, if you are properly and averagely exposed, and most cameras this assumes an 18% gray of the subject matter, your histogram is going to show is, is going to show a sort of a bell-shaped curve right in the middle of the uh, histogram. If you're banging it on the right, you've got a mountain on your right. If you uh, underexpose the picture, the histogram is on the left. In distinction to what most people will tell you to do with night photography, I look for histograms that are bunched to the left, underexposed. And we're going to talk more about this as we go along in my presentation and get into straight night photography. The, there, are, there are a couple of reasons for um, bunching your histogram like that and underexposing in night photography. If you don't do that, your camera doesn't know whether you're photographing day or night. If you, if you do an average correct exposure, um, 
uh, excuse me for a second. If you do an average correct exposure, it's going to look like daylight, and that's not the point of a night photo. You want it to look like night. This one is included because it, viewers are not always sure what they're looking at. Look at your computer screen right now and tell, ask yourself, are you looking at mountains or a beach? Um, the answer, of course, is a beach. The, the place you might start photographing in the night is with a moon. This was a photograph of a, uh, and I think a bigger version of it is next. This is a photograph of a moon during a lunar eclipse with a slight fog halo around the moon. The moon presents a difficult exposure problem because the contrast between the night sky and the moon is huge. The moon is essentially daylight reflected back. So typically at ISO 100, I photograph a shot like this of the moon through a long lens at about eight seconds. That, that is going to overexpose the white part. You see there's no detail in the white part of the moon, but be roughly right for the mid part of the moon. This is a photograph out on Point Reyes, near, fairly near where I live. And the, the, the thing about this is that it's a night photo. If you look at it, you see that there are colors, uh, daylight apparent colors in it, but this was actually about a half hour after sunset, and the scene to the naked eye was uh, pitch black. And furthermore, when I looked at the um, photo in my LCD screen after I took it, for the most part, you could see that there was maybe a little gray detail in it, but mostly it was black. So what happens is, first of all, it's worth saying right here and now that all, all the night photos I shoot are raw photos. And as a practical matter, it's essentially impossible to shoot good, deep night photos in uh, JPEG or anything other than raw. So what happens is when I actually started looking at this in Adobe Camera Raw, the uh, utility that comes with Photoshop, what I, I took the exposure slider and I moved it to the right and I started to see colors. The case study. You'll hey, Harold. Yes. Someone asked, "How long is that exposure again?" This is a this is a this is a, a couple of minute exposure. Okay. Also, could you move your mouse cursor off the off the photograph? Okay. I don't see. Uh, sure. Got it. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Sorry Any to other, interrupt. That's okay. Any other questions, Catherine? Uh, no, that was it. So because there are no stupid questions. There are only good questions. The, I, I have in, in the Light and Exposure book, I have a reproduction of the way uh, this thing looked on default settings as, as an almost black image, and then how this image actually looks. So this was one of my kind of early night landscapes that came out looking like day. And for me, it was a bit of a revelation that actually there were these colors. What are these colors? Well, the stuff on the cliff was the residue of sunset, the light beyond the visible spectrum that I could not see, but was there, and that the camera picked up. Another, another from the same shoot. This is uh, basically looking out at blackness. So two points here. Uh, I, I get the question a lot. How do you know, how, how are you able to photograph something you can't see? number one. And that's a good question. I Mostly what you do is you put the camera on the tripod, you do an exposure that's roughly right, and you, uh, you pray. And you come back and you see what you have. And you don't know till you actually open it up on the computer because you can't tell from the camera. You simply cannot tell. The fact is, though, as you can see from these pictures, that there are tons of colors out there. This was a you're, you're looking at another uh, you're looking at another image from the uh, from the from the deep night. This is a uh, Tennessee beach in the Marin Headlands. You can see some boats out at sea. It was probably two in the morning. Uh, some reflected lights from the boats and from little towns around the Marin coast, but mostly pretty black. No no sunset, no moon, just starlight. 
And when, when I look at this, I think that this quote from Vincent van Gogh that I have down here, it often seems to me that the night is much more alive and richly colored than the day, is so true. How van Gogh knew that, I don't know, but his paintings show that he did. And there, there are magnificent colors in the night. We think of the night as black and white, but that's a limitation of our perception, not the reality of the, of the various waves of uh, light that are uh, bouncing around out there. And as a good example of this, in one of my earlier uh, night photography experiments, I photographed this Indian paintbrush head down in pitch black at an exposure of about two minutes. And was really surprised to find these colors in it. The the flower is giving off um, mostly, mostly UV rays here that the sensor picks up that our eyes can't see. Moving back. So, so Harold, here's, here's a couple questions that are coming in. One person is asking, how do you determine how long the exposure time should be? I've heard you answer that before. <laughs> so. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> what, what have I answered it before? I need to be... Well, it depends. Right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I mean, there's no light meter on Earth that's going to help you know the exposure at night. A, uh, in, in, a, in an otherwise black sky, uh, starlight is four minutes at ISO 100 and F4 or F5.6. That's kind of a starting place for night photography. Beyond that, you sort of have to, you, you, yeah, I mean, you sort of have to extrapolate from that kind of thing. Uh, you know, if, if photographs like the one that's up right now, the slide of the Golden Gate Bridge with the Bay Bridge through it and some airplanes and things flying around making streaks of light, that's, that's in the realm of under a minute, and there you can actually use many in-camera light meters to help you find it. Uh, it's not as hard. But in true night, uh, getting, getting a starting point of exposure is uh, something that there's no, there's nothing other than the rule of thumb that I just told you to really go go with. If you're looking at darker areas, you need to make it longer. If you more have the sky, you probably don't want to get too much shorter than the exposure that, that I mentioned. Um, you can also bracket like crazy mm -hmm. if you have the patience. I mean, mm -hmm. there there are two ways of there are two ways of going with these exposures. If you go if you go with a straight long exposure of 20 or 30 minutes, which some of the ones we're going to get to are, then my suggestion is to turn in-camera long exposure noise reduction on if that's a feature that's available in your camera. It is in most uh, DSLRs. That, however, adds, again, the length of the exposure to the time you have to wait before you can use the camera again. And if you add to that the fact that um, batteries are limited maybe to about 40 minutes per battery, the number of exposures you can actually make a night in night photography um, is limited. The, I'm, I'm tempted to say that the, the challenge is part of what makes it fun. And I'm also tempted to say that, therefore, people who do enjoy doing this kind of work and who get pictures out of it love each other. There's okay. less competition among night photographers than other areas because it really is hard to figure out how to do this, and it's a sort of crazy thing to do. Why poke your camera off a cliff in pitch blackness when you had to walk through pitch blackness to get to the cliff, and you're going to have to walk back afterwards, and you don't know whether you're going to get anything out of it? I have spent many nights uh, photographing and come back with results that are not useful. So since I have some decent photos in here, you can only assume that I uh, spent a lot more than the nights that I didn't come back with something. Right, Catherine? That's true. That's true. And you have some great stories, too. Um, so I'm, I'm here, here I'm looking through some of the shorter pictures. We're, looking, we're, we're in the realm of 30 seconds or a minute in terms of... Oh, and Harold, that, that's another thing people have been asking. If you could please uh, mention the exposure time, f-stops, and ISO. Well, let me let me say about that that uh, you know I will try I will try to do that. However, uh, the information on every single one of these is published on my blog. Right. Okay. okay that's so, right. So that's perhaps a better way to look it up than for me to because I I can't tell you always looking at a picture accurately what the uh, 
what the, what, the, what the stats on it are. I have a pretty good idea of the exposure time, because usually I remember what I was doing and thinking about that. The f-stop, though, that's, a, that's something that, to tell you the truth, to be accurate about, I have to look up, too. ISO is easy because, in almost every case, I use as low an ISO as possible. Now, Correct. you know, there, there's another kind of night photography that uses higher ISOs, and we'll, I'm going to talk about that in, with, in, a couple, uh, in a bit with a couple of slides. But for the most part, almost every exposure shown in this presentation is ISO, is ISO 100, which is the lowest that my camera does. Uh, okay. The point of a photo like this, which, as I said, is uh, somewhere between 30, uh, 30 seconds and a minute in length, is to um, it, it is the patterns and paintings that the light of the cars make on the uh, on the ground. Um, I suspect I, 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 with it, with this image, in fact, it was stopped down fairly far. It was about f sixteen because I was trying to make it a longer exposure. And then let me let me make a comment here on exposure lengths also, and that is that I used to think that the longest timed exposure that you could do with a camera, which is normally 30 seconds, was a really long exposure, a very long exposure. And I, I really didn't understand that much about bulb settings. Almost all the images in this presentation are longer than 30 seconds and made on a bulb setting. Well, I take it back. This is a eight second exposure. And the moon is rising under the Golden Gate Bridge. And the point here for me was to center the tour boat, whose lights you see in the middle of this photo, so that it made a spread out display under the rising moon. And I needed a, a, an exposure that was both long enough in time so that the boat light spread out, but short enough so that the moon was caught in, with some crispness. And that, it's worth noting that if you're photographing at night, one of the main things that's going to be your subject is moving lights. Some people like to introduce these lights themselves. In some cases, the lights come from stars or other celestial objects, uh, the moon. But sometimes it's human things like this boat going past. Here's another roughly eight-second exposure of the moon uh, rising over the Golden Gate from a place called Kirby Cove on the um, banks of the Golden Gate. This is a 30-second exposure from the top of Mission Peak looking toward Mount Diablo. You can see the fog in the uh, in foreground here, and you can see the, the lights of the freeway there have become a solid snake of light. And this, again, I'm going to mention that this is a raw exposure. What raw capture enables you to do is to process it differently for uh, the foreground and background, or any other areas you choose to do. So in this case, I lightened the foreground, to which, came, which originally was pretty dark. This is a almost total night photo at about 30 seconds, looking along South Beach on Point Reyes. And the point of the photo here is the colors that are starting to come into it, which are not what you see by naked eye. And I've, I've always I'm in, included this, uh, this photo in my uh, night photo show. But again, once again, it's not really a night image, because the sun is just falling off the edge of the cloud bank here. So part of the point here is to um, show that the virtue of night photography is that you get to be in, one of the virtues of night photography is you get to be in places without fear that you want to photograph for sunset, and then, hey, I'm going to walk back in the dark. Well, so what? You're used to being out in the night. It doesn't have the same sense of anything. And as Catherine uh, also said, you do get into various adventures, like getting kicked out of national park places, because this was uh, up on Mount Tom, where they, where shortly after I took this photo, and the next uh, one here of with, under starlight from the same place, I got kicked out because I wasn't supposed to be there, which is another whole other topic because night photographers feel they should be allowed to be anywhere that is a public park at night, but the people who are custodians of the parks don't always feel the same way. Uh, you're looking here. You can begin to judge exposure length by the star trails. Um, you'll see uh, the star trail in this photo says to me, I'm looking at about a five-minute exposure. The 
on on the subject of star trails, and um, I want to do want to make sure we get to some real circular star trail photos, which I have toward the end of the uh, presentation. The trick to getting and as, uh, the trick to getting good round star trails is to use as wide an angle lens as possible and to be pointed as as much due north as one possibly can. And I'm, I'm going to give some pointers on how you know at night whether you're due north. That is, if you're not carrying your little portable GPS with a compass, which is probably an easier way of doing it than, uh, than doing it by the stars. So I'm going to move here into uh, photos that are a little bit darker. So we're, we're going about 30 seconds to a minute here, but they're pointed out at dark landscapes. This was a dark landscape at night with a rain cloud coming on. Uh, about a minute after I, after I took the photo, I started packing up the camera and tripod, and rain started falling down hard. This is a fisheye lens photo, a digital fisheye, 10.5 millimeter lens. Uh, night photos are not only of distant things in landscapes. This is a uh, Christmas lamp light, or as they say in England, a fairy light reflected in a, a water drop. This is a, a three-minute exposure of uh, Mono Lake at uh, 2 in the morning. Uh, it's, as, as, as you'll remember, I was talking about histograms and saying that if you put the histogram in the middle so that it's a properly exposed picture, you get a day for night effect. You, you apparently are in daylight, although it's actually nighttime. That's what happened here. You can see the uh, star pinpoints up, up, in the, up in the sky, and you can see the trail, the snake, left by the car along US 395 along this lonesome stretch of road here. But if you weren't really looking carefully, you might think this is a daylight image. This is um, moonrise over the ghost town of Bodie in California. And I was lucky enough to be out in Bodie this last summer and photograph it at night, which was a, a great thing to do. And uh, here's another uh, day for night image. This was an eight minute exposure of an old factory building, the old stamp mill at Bodie, from a sort of a drainage ditch. And the, the point about this photo is you look at it at first and you say, OK, this is another tourist shot of a stamp mill at Bodie. And then if you look a little more carefully, you can see the star trails and you say, oh my god, it was at night. And again, a comparable kind of effect, except this one was photographed. This is the Tioga Pass Road in the, in the Sierras. This one was photographed in a deep blackness of a cut valley with the moonlight lighting the mountains behind, a three-minute exposure. And the point here for me is really the contrast in this image. It, there's the grandeur of the mountains and the single car making this line across it. And again, another point worth make, making is that one or two cars make a huge difference in night photography. This is a uh, place called. Oh, Harold! Someone yes. was asking about that last photo and asking why there was a shadow in the foreground. The shadow you see in the foreground of this photo is the shadow created by the moonlight. The, so the moonlight uh, coming the, up over a mountain. The moon was behind me here, coming okay. up over a mountain. Okay, got it. Thanks. It's beautiful. This is, uh, this is a place called The Wave on the Arizona-New Mexico border in the uh, Pariah Bureau of Land Management Wilderness Area. And I waited here until after dark to photograph the place by night. And so those are the star trails in behind. This is about a 10-minute uh, exposure. The, as a consequence of having stayed here, I got lost in the desert on my way home. and so. I, instead of falling into a canyon, I stopped where I was, and I spent the night photographing stars till my batteries ran out. So as Catherine says, I have lots of stories to tell. And we'll get to some of them. But this is a urban image from the top of Mission Peak. And for, for me, uh, it's sort of like, I don't know whether it's beautiful or ugly or a jellyfish or a city, but here it is. And 
looking down again at downtown San Jose from the top of Mission Peak. This is about an eight-minute exposure. If uh, the, the the huge range in light and dark here is what fascinated me, because this is like a finger coming across the thing, and to and to clear out the different folds in the hillside, I needed to work on doing the raw captures in several different ways. And this is a five-minute exposure from Point Reyes looking towards San Francisco. And you can see the lights of the city, at, which is a bright, almost a burst coming out over the peninsula with the star pricks coming through the clouds. And the reason you see the, the, the stars at all is the cloud was moving, so it has a semi-transparent effect of beams of light coming at you. Once again, the theme here is um, motion. It's also worth noting this is a fairly noisy image. The combination of the long exposure time and the left-leaning histogram uh, leads to the noise that you see, particularly in the lower right of this image and then also in the cliff. Some of this noise could be processed out. That's an aesthetic judgment. Noise processing for removal inevitably leads to a less sharp image. It's not always the right thing to do. Um, this is a image of mine that's become pretty widely reproduced. It's a five-minute exposure of Point Reyes at night. Um, one of the things that interests me about the photo is the little flashlight trail. And here I am going to put my mouse over it that you see right here. And this, this was the ranger, uh, Craig, who let me photograph the place at night. And, but he didn't know I had the shutter open while I was taking this picture. So he called out. Craig, Harold, where are you? And he started coming up the stairs. And I called, Craig, I'm taking an exposure. Please turn off your flashlight. And right here, he, he sort of stood for a second, he understood what was going on, and then he turned off the flashlight. Um, any questions about this photo? No? I think a lot of people, um, let me see. People have been asking about the, the noise. One person did ask, it said, just commented that it seemed like film would be better for some of these shots. Well, you know, film has pluses and minuses. One thing that digital doesn't have that film uh, did have is reciprocity failure. With, mm -hmm. with film in reciprocity failure, um, you you have color shifts and and lose information at exposures longer than a certain point. That doesn't happen with digital. Um, you know, it's it's one of these things. It's a different look with film. The uh, I I would never shoot this stuff with film, and I'm not entirely sure that it would be possible. But but on the other hand, there's some great night film uh, images. So different strokes for different folks, basically. One of the one of the grand things about digital is you can change the sensitivity and ISO on the fly, which is a useful point. And you know, I've been saying how you really can't see anything in the camera. Well, the fact is, you can at least see a histogram, so you get some instant information about whether you're roughly on the right exposure or not. If you shoot a roll of film. You're really in the dark, so to speak, about whether you have anything or not until the film's been processed. Um, mm -hmm. The biggest plus uh, uh, with digital, however, is the ability to take advantage of the range of a raw exposure, which gives, which is there's a huge amount of exposure latitude and a different processing options that, for the most part, if you take the default values, you never see. I heard uh, another question there. Oh, yeah. There are a couple questions about the light in the lighthouse. One person was asking, how is it not too blown? And the other person, um, yeah, how do you stop the lighthouse from blowing out in the long, long exposure? And another person said, are you um, holding some color detail in the light of the tower? Is it a separate exposure? Well, these are very good questions. Um, it's not a separate exposure. Uh, it, I, I did process it specially in the raw file to try to hold detail, but the, the key point here was actually a photographic point, not a Photoshop point, and that is that the, the lighthouse is lit in, but shuttered in this image. The ones I did where it was uh, unshuttered, in fact, it was just too blown out compared to the rest of the photos to do, have anything uh, to, to be able to, to make. Well, you know, I, I actually had a version with the full light on and without the shutters, that was reasonable, but this is just a better image because because mostly of the detail in the lighthouse, the combination of the detail in the lighthouse and the sky and the foreground is really pretty unusual. 
So the the answer there is that that's a um, that's part of the. I I was lucky in that being there by myself with with this Craig this ranger let me experiment with various different possibilities and how the lighthouse was was lit. And you're not looking at the full lighthouse light. Good question. Ah. Ah, okay. And a couple other questions, if you have a second. One person was asking about uh, displaying the histogram on your LCD. Can you do it? Can you view it? What he said specifically? Do you have to fool around with your camera to display the histogram on your LCD, or can you only view it afterwards? Uh, well. You know, this is one of those hardware-specific questions that there's going to be different answers for different uh, cameras. But mm -hmm. mostly, mostly there is one one touch ability to look at an exposure histogram. When you display the photo um, you, that you've just taken, you then use the controller button usually to press the up arrow, and it'll show you the histogram. Okay. And then you hit the down arrow to go back to the photo display. So these are not live view things because most DSLRs don't really work that well with live view. But they're immediately after you take the photo, you see the image reviewed on the screen, and you press a button, and you see the histogram, and then you press the button again, and the histogram goes away. Okay, good. And then one other question: Someone is asking if you can damage your digital your camera due to these long exposures. That's a good. That's a good question to which I don't know the answer. Um, the it comes up a lot as a question, both in workshops and uh, and and it, I think somebody asked it on the last night web. They did. Also. They did. <laughs> uh, I'm going to answer it a little differently this time. I mean, it's a sort of serious question. First of all, I really don't know the answer. I, I have to admit, I'm hard on equipment. Uh, the uh, the attitude I take is that cameras are tools meant for taking pictures. And if I got a great picture and ruined a camera, well, that would be life. Um, <laughs> I, you, know, that, you know, that said, I've also had uh, cameras fall down, lenses fall down, and I do carry an insurance rider on my equipment. As I think I might have said before, if the insurance company had any idea that I was tottering around out there with, uh, in, in pitch blackness with this stuff, they might think twice because it doesn't cost very much to have an insurance rider on equipment. A technical question of whether uh, taking all these long exposures damages the digital camera, I have no reason to think it really does. Okay? Uh, okay. I, you know, it's something one would address at Nikon or Canon or whomever the manufacturer is. I've not seen any warning printed that it should. I don't see why it would particularly. But then again, if it did, it also wouldn't shock me. Does that, that answer the question? I mean, you know, it's like people use these cameras as production tools in studios, and they shoot with them for, you know, 24 hours at a stretch. Compared to that, this is fairly minor usage. Bear in mind that in terms of the noise issue, noise is a byproduct often of heat. So as you start to build up heat in your sen uh, in your in your camera, the sensor picks up picks it up, and it's reproduced as noise. So uh, in some ways, the sort of Taking one long exposure, waiting, and then taking another seems less stressful to me on equipment than than somebody who's shooting uh, a model constantly on a runway. But you know, if, on the other hand, uh, these are fairly fragile machines in their own way. And my own attitude is, if they break, they break, and you send them in for repair or get another one. God Good. help me. Good. We have a lot of questions coming in, but I believe that you answer them as you go on with okay. the presentation, so I'll just let you proceed. OK. Yeah, and also I think we're sort of, uh, it, it, time is moving on, and we have more pictures here. If there are questions at the end, we can surely answer them. But feel free to interrupt, too, if you think it's relevant. This is a, a Bodhi at night, about an eight-minute exposure over a general store there. I included the image because I like the way the very low wattage light bulbs, which is the light source from in the mercantile store here, worked in combination with the uh, sky. And this is a uh, night photography of the uh, urban industry school rather than a uh, straight dark night at the old Mare Island uh, naval base near the Bay Area, where a lot of the battleships used in World War II were built. There were thousands of workers working here during that time, and now it's deserted. The lights in the foreground of this photo are a car that came past and then stopped right there. You don't see anything else of the car, though. 
Golden Gate Bridge at night, 10-minute um, exposure roughly. The, you can see the way the static lamps on this length exposure halo out and make stars, which, which I like. But the straight traffic where it's really heavy has blown out a little, and there's not much you can do about that. But you say, hey. And then a closer up view from the same spot with the traffic as patterns on the bridge, uh, about a 10-minute uh, exposure here. 12-minute exposure from the end of the Santa Cruz Pier straight out to sea. I saw that there was a sailboat out there. I couldn't see anything else. Uh, the satellite or airplane coming down in this photo, is it a feature or is it a bug? It certainly interrupts the pattern of the sky. But I come to the point, and I will show an image toward the end of this presentation that makes this point, where I think that some of the man-made objects you see in the celestial sky are as interesting as the stars. So I like to try to include them when I can as part of the composition. I'm getting here to some longer exposures. This was a uh, uh, about a 10-minute exposure at ISO 800 of Half Dome. And I note the ISO 800 because it's not my typical stance of doing as low ISO as possible. I think in this case, the higher ISO and the processing of the noise afterwards has created an almost watercolor effect, which I like. It's very, it's a, it's, it's very different. This is a 40-minute exposure just of star trails from the top of Half Dome. Uh, in, in the middle of the night on uh, one of the longest nights of the year. And it's basically just an abstract composition showing the star trails going around in a, in a segment. A 20-minute exposure from Olmsted Point along the Tioga Road looking towards Half Dome. You can see Half Dome in this photo. And this is, this is sort of a classic deep night kind of exposure. There's no moonlight in this photo. There's no human light. Everything here is starlight. And something like this takes 20 minutes with the camera wide open, ISO 100. This is a uh, view of Zion Canyon in Utah. There's one car down there that's made all that light, which goes back to my point that a single car can, can make uh, a ton of light. And the I, I was standing about. Uh, halfway up the canyon, on the left of me, is, a, is the bottom of a, something called Angel's Landing, which is a pillar looking out. And I was standing in pitch black looking out at this. The, um, and here, from more or less the same spot as a view looking in the other direction, uh, more like north. And the point you can see in the middle of the star is going around like this is Polaris, the North Star, which is what, what one needs to look for if you're looking to create the most possible circularness in your, in your stars. So when I photographed this church at Bodhi at night, I made sure to line it up looking north. You can see the uh, North Star on the left side of the steeple here. What I also did was I painted, it's, this is a 20 minute exposure, I painted with light. I had a little pen light flashlight that I used. And during the entire exposure, I, I walked round and round this building behind the camera, taking care never to fire the light directly at the camera lens, but pointing it through the windows so that it lit up the inside where the door of this church is. Because um, if by eye, you, without that extra um, light painting, you wouldn't be able to see anything inside the church here. This is a long exposure from the time that I mentioned at the wave where I was lost in the desert. And this is one of the last couple of things I did before my batteries ran out. I just pointed it up at the desert of the night sky. And uh, when I processed this photo, I was glad to see that I'd stopped where I'd stopped because I did, don't know that walking across this terrain in pitch blackness is such a brilliant idea. And and this again is is the uh, is a shoot from the same time. The purple flaring you see here is a sensor getting too hot, which is a, an issue in night photography. Although, as I'll show you in a couple of uh, circular pictures, uh, it's a sometimes a feature as well as a bug. You can use the colors it generates. You can also see in this. Uh, long exposure of circular star trails on the left-hand side, a straight line of a satellite coming down. 
This is a 40-minute exposure of the of one of my favorite subjects, the old fishing trawler Point Reyes, which is anchored outside uh, of the general store in Inverness, California. And you're going to see a couple of photos of this boat in here. Here's one with a wide angle with a fisheye wide angle lens pointed right at the boat with Polaris lined up, the North Star lined up behind the boat to create the maximum possible uh, star circles. And um, these, this is a series of the Tennessee Beach photos at night. Uh, this is a Yosemite valley with star trails coming in with the valley itself lit by moonlight. So it's a, one of these uh, night photos. And this is a 30-minute exposure of Half Dome with star trails rushing into the valley. And another similar thing of the Marin Coast. I'm, I'm going to show a couple of longer uh, single exposures, and then I'm going to move to a technique called uh, stacking, which is combining multiple night exposures, which has some advantages. So this is a roughly two-hour exposure. The really bright light you see in the, uh, in the photo is the moon setting. It's hard to have a photo like this without getting some lens artifacts in the photo. Feature or bug, I like them in this photo, but these hexagrams you see are reflections of the light uh, on the lens. I, I pair this with this photo, which I shot as a test for the next one. It's not bad in and of itself, but it's a high ISO image that you use to get the exposure right. And then since ISO is a linear scale, you can simply use the arithmetic to calculate back for your longer exposure. Since you get one crack at these things a night, it's a good idea to be able to do the test. The calculations between the two of them and the two photos of the case study are shown in my light and exposure book. It's worth mentioning that I use a programmable interval timer to time these shots. It's, it, I think the technical name for the thing is an in, intervalvulator. Uh, what it lets you do is it lets you set a delay, uh, a number of exposures, and the time of the exposure. So for something like this, which was, uh, or the next one, uh, which were two or three hour exposures in the middle of the night, uh, I don't actually have to be there. All I have to do is set the camera up set the program the thing, make sure it's programmed right, and go away and come back. And there's the issue, since I noted that a battery lasts about 40 minutes, however, you can't do an exposure like this on a battery. You need AC power to do it. And uh, you don't, don't always have to suffer to do these images. This was up at uh, Sea Ranch, and I was in a hot tub while this thing was happening. Another exposure of the same sort. Stacking is a technique for uh, for uh, doing night photography that combines many shorter exposures in, as opposed to a single longer exposure. The great advantage of stacking is that you have noise reduction when you do it. What you do is you say, OK, starlight is four minutes. Let me take 10 or 12 or 20 four-minute exposures and combine them. You'll find if you search for stacking star trails on, in Google, you'll find a bunch of uh, programs that will do it. Some of them are actually free. But what I use is an action that comes with the extended version of uh, Photoshop CS3 that's called statistics, as in the terrible subject you studied maybe when you were in college. It's the, uh, and the statistics action in Photoshop allows gives you a bunch of different options as to how you want to combine your images. I use the Typically, I use the maximize one, which shows you the lightest spots of the images you take. So this is a stacked fisheye photo um, of from looking down from the old inspiration point onto Yosemite Valley. I combined a single lighter capture of the foreground with 10 stacked three-minute exposures for the background. Stacked. A uh, photo from um, Glacier Point using about 12 exposures. The brightness in this photo in the foreground areas comes from moonlight. So here's a version of the same from the same place where after the moon had set. And the 
I, I think this is a better image of the two. It has a very Van Goghian look to me. But you'll note the purple color up in the left, and that comes from sensor noise. My sensor was starting to really seriously overheat by then. Coming back to somebody's question about whether this damages equipment, I'm not sure how bright it is to intentionally get your sensor to overheat, but there you have it. Um, another stacked image along the Marin coast. Note the, um, I'm going to move my mouse pointer and point it right at Polaris here. Uh, note that it's pointed there. If I had pointed this this one south, you would not get the circular effect at all. Um, this is a photo I took in mid-November at a place called Pigeon Point on the San Mateo coast of California. The Pigeon Point Lighthouse is a the old historic building that isn't really used as a lighthouse anymore. It's a park, and they light it in mid-November, one Saturday. Um, of the year, you'll see that it's blown out there. Um, I'm going to again point the mouse at the at the blowout of the lighthouse. No way that I could actually capture the real lighthouse light and the other stuff in the same image. However, um, what I like about this one again, I, again, I intentionally located myself to point north so I'd get maximum circularity. It's a big event, you know. Photographers really come around. There are police barricades up. It's hard to be anywhere without other photographers when you're doing this. The uh, there were a couple of airplanes that came to check it out, and you can see their trails going round and round like this. I think that is so much fun. For me, what really works about this image is the airplane trail and maybe the way the surf looks when you when you do an aggregate exposure of about an hour, which is what this is. Here's a uh, view of this, uh, an eight-minute exposure of, point, of the Point Reyes trawler with a um, fisheye lens. And I'm including that because that's one of the ones that was used to make up this bigger star track, uh, star, uh, stacked star trail image. Say that 10 times fast, please. And I'm now at the end of my uh, official and formal presentation. Once again, you can find my email address down there, info at photoblog2, if you have specific questions that you want to address to me. And I'm going to throw it open to you, Catherine, and for questions. OK, what, what's the difference between stacking and using multiple layers in Photoshop? Well, I mean, there is no difference, uh, except mm -hmm. that uh, stacking the stacking is automated use of layers. In other words, if you use layers, what you have to do is you have to paste the layers on top of each other and put masks on and determine where you want the where you want each layer to show and where it doesn't show using layer masks and painting. And you know, I do some of that, and in some cases, some of my stacked images have have layers that have been pasted on in Photoshop. But when you when you stack them, it it uses an algorithm to determine what shows where, and in particular, on this maximum mode with statistics, it determines if the star trails show and nothing else, basically. Uh -huh. OK, we've had a lot of questions from people about um, what time of the year is best for taking these photos, what time of night is best for taking these photos, what ki time, type of weather. So can you tell us? how you approach this. I, I think the answer is all of that. I mean, any type of weather, any type of... Well, not any type of weather, actually. I mean, these, okay. are very, these are very good questions. They're not always easy to answer. First of all, if you... Uh, you know, I thought it would be interesting sometimes to photograph in a uh, foggy cloud. It turns out it's really, for the most... Not. <laughs> not. Yeah. So, so in some ways, the clearer the night, the better. You're looking for really clear nights. Now that, unfortunately, is in conflict with something else that you might like, which is to have them be warm, balmy nights. Uh, so really clear nights tend to tend, at least around here, to be more wintry than summery. Um, however, if you're in a place where there's snow, snow on the ground leads to problems because the snow itself is so bright that it reflects back light. The moon is also a big factor uh, because you know, sometimes you want to do night photography with moonlight in it, but it's such, as I said at the beginning of this presentation, such a hugely contrast, high contrast light in terms of its dynamic range compared with 
uh, starlight or background scenery that that it pre it presents exposure problems. So likely images with moonlight are going to be about the moonlight, not about starlight. So star photos are better done on moonless nights. Um, sometimes a crescent moon, like we've actually had recently, is hugely interesting. Something to look for. Uh, I, I'd suggest if you happen to have a good GPS, if they've got good uh, celestial information in them and can tell you about the phases of the moon where you are locally. It's something to watch for. There's no time of night that's better than any other time of night in terms of do you want to do it after sunset or before sunrise. That may depend on the kind of person you are. You know, if it's after sunset, you have a crack at drinking enough caffeine to really stay up late and still get a decent <laughs> night's sleep. Whereas if you, you know, if you get up at two in the morning and walk for an hour to be where you want to photograph and then photograph for a couple of hours, well, I don't know about you, but I usually feel pretty tired after doing that by about six o'clock the next night. So, I tend to do it more often after sunset than before sunrise, but that's just personal taste. There's no there's no real issue there. I mean, you know, you have to spend a lifetime out there doing this to really get the full answers to these questions. If you think of night as being half of our world and a world that we're really not so very familiar with, and if somebody asked you what's the best time and whether to photograph during the day, well, you wouldn't really have one answer there, would you? Uh, you could say, as many photographers do, uh, I shouldn't be photographing right around noon. That's the worst light. You, you know, sometimes I say, well, hey, uh, when, when, when I'm on a location shoot, I say, hey, a lot of the time I, I can sleep from about uh, 10 to 3 or 4. I'm interested in the light right after the sun rises and just before the sun sets. That's, that's when you have dramatic light. To some extent, the same thing is true in night. You tend to get really dramatic light for an hour or two after sunset and maybe for an hour before dawn, and less so at 2 or 3 in the morning. But there's no bad time, really, uh, unless you're in the cloud. OK. Um, someone just asked a question I thought was amusing. How many injuries have you sustained getting to and from these photos? genic areas in darkness. Now, I know you've been kicked out of some parks because you told me that. Yes, I have been kicked out of parks. Uh, I, I am, I, knock wood, I, I'm really lucky that I have not sustained injuries. I've had, um, I, yeah, I've simply not sustained injuries. The, uh, you know, I've fallen, I, I, fell, I fall fairly frequently, but so far, fortunately, I haven't fallen very far and I fall well. So I'm 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 all all whole at this point. I can't claim uh, I can't claim injuries of combat. Thank God. I do um, I do carry one of these Find Me Spot global satellite uh, positioning things with me when I go at night. And what this will do is it will send out a message saying I'm in trouble, I need help, or it will actually also uh, call 911 search and rescue directly. I'm a little skeptical that this thing actually works. I've never actually had to try it, but it does make my uh, spouse uh, uh, seem more comfortable with me doing these things. Good. Now, uh, we are losing a few people, but I hope that we can answer a couple more questions, because there are, there are two specifically. Um, one person wants to know, and a few people have asked this, is there a way to judge in advance what kind of noise levels you're going to get from a photo? Or um, he's, he's asking, what were you doing differently in the clearer pictures, or is it just a consequence of timing and tools? So, well, again, there's no one answer here. It's, it's, it's a good question. You, can, uh, you know, noise comes from many different factors is the problem. Uh, hot sensor, as I mentioned, is one of them. Overheated sensor is one of them. Long exposures in and of itself introduces noise uh, over time. Um, also, underexposing, which I've suggested is something to do, inherently introduces noise. That's one of the drawbacks of doing it. Uh, noise is random. It's, it's a random, um, it's a it's a randomly distributed uh, signal going awry. Basically, it's sort of like what happens uh, in, if you know, when you pick up uh, sound waves and radio and you have static. It's static on the line. It's not predictable. So. Mm -hmm. Other than knowing that if you're going to do a really long exposure and if your sensor is heating up and if you're underexposing that you're likely to get noise, it's a, there's, there's no real uh, single answer to this. C uh, cameras are getting better and better about it. 
the larger your sensor in the camera, the larger the pixels, the less susceptible to this kind of noise they are, in fact. So, the, so there are hardware issues and hardware limitations, although those seem to be getting better. And any follow-up on that? Does, does that make the situation clear? I think that does. And then there were so many comments about the amount of color that you had in your photographs. And I remember exclaiming over that the first time I saw them, too. And um, people want to know, how much tweaking do you do? Is that rich color there when you take the picture? Or do you have to do you add saturation, boost the saturation, Photoshop, or? Well, I think the answer to that. I think the answer to that question. It's com another complicated and good question. Um, the, I mean, the short answer is both. The longer answer is, uh, you know, that my my attitude towards a digital photo is that there is no such thing in a digital photo as what is exactly there. A photo is in its entirety an artifact, anyhow. And you, and and what's the sense that it's re, that it, in what sense is a photo ever recreating what's exactly there? You know, old time practitioners of classical photography used to justify their darkroom work by saying, "Okay, I'm making it look more like it looked when I was there, or my memory of the scene." I'm not sure that one really needs that kind of uh, philosophic justification. The I, I work on all my images in Photoshop. That said. A raw file contain, is a potentiality, as Ansel Adams put it regarding black and white photography. His his negative is his score, and his print is is his performance. A raw file is a score. What you do with it, how you post process it, is your performance. Um, the the there's a huge amount of variation possible within a raw file of both color values and saturation values and exposure range. And I surely take advantage of that. And I surely uh, work to enhance what I get. But, in, but that said, in some real sense, the colors are there. Great answer. And then one quick question. People want to know what kind of camera you use. I'm shooting with the, the, the photos you saw in this presentation are shot with a Nikon D300 and a Nikon D200. Good. And I want to thank everyone who has been in this uh, presentation for answering each other's questions. That's been wonderful. And I know Harold couldn't get to all of them, but I thought everyone did a great job of uh, jumping in and, and sharing their knowledge with other people. And Harold did say that you can write him directly. His email address is on uh, the slide that you're seeing on your screen now. You can also visit his blog and get a lot of information. Harold, is there anything else you want to add? No, I don't think so, other than thank you very much, everybody, and see you out there in the night, I hope. Oh, yeah. And, uh, and Harold does some great workshops, too. So check his blog for information on those. Harold, thank you. And thank you, everyone else, for joining us today. Hope you can join us again. Thanks, Catherine. Sure. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.